Thank you. I hope you'll uh, forgive the raspiness of my voice. I, uh, I lost it a week ago Tuesday, and I've been trying to get it back ever since, and it just keeps, it comes, and then it, it goes away. Uh, my wife is quite happy uh, about that for some reason. I don't understand. I have such a lot to say. Uh, you know, this is really, I, I really am excited to be here. We're in the room with three men who were at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And that's an amazing thing. It, I mean, picture it. Picture, picture it. Just, just kind of go back with me a little bit. It's Hawaii. There's, I mean, can it get any worse? <laughs> it's a beautiful Sunday morning. Maybe you've got the duty that day. You get up and you go about. Now, in the military, we, we, we don't get up at 7. We get up at 5 or 5.30. And sometimes we get up at 3, depending upon the mission. Now, most of the time when we get up at 5 or 5.30, we wait around for three hours to do something, but that's just the way we are. But imagine you get up in the morning and you're going about your duty. Maybe you're going to church. Maybe, as we may have all seen this picture of them playing baseball. Maybe you're out on pass. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. And you hear a little rumbling, maybe. And you see some planes flying overhead, and you're thinking, oh, the, the Army's doing its, its, uh, its drill. At that time, they had the Army Air Corps. And maybe the Army's doing some, some drill, and that's why I'm hearing these explosions. And you look at the markings on these planes, and you see a different marking than you've ever seen before. And suddenly, you realize that these sirens, well, it's not a drill. It's real. You see the smoke starting to rise from Battleship Row. You see all of those nice planes that we lined up so nice and neat. They're all gone because they got strafed and they're all in burning. You see men and women running around trying to figure out what to do. And suddenly it hits you. Your life will never be the same again. You're in the middle, the start of the great World War II. There will be many more battles, thousands upon thousands of men and women lost, defending their country. All changed within a few moments of time. You know, we in the military live in a tradition. It goes back to our founding fathers. When we raise our right hand and swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. We swear to protect this country with our lives, our honor, and our sacred fortunes. We give up a lot of things to serve this country, just as these men and those men and women that served back in, the 19, in 1941 did. They had no idea what was going to happen when they served. I had a real good friend, Medal of Honor recipient from Southern Illinois, and he said, you know, I got home one day during the Depression. I was 16 years old. He says, and my dad met me at the gate leading up to our little farm. And he said, my dad had packed a gunny sack full of food and my, some clothes. And he said, son, he says, I can't feed you anymore. I've got to take care of your brothers and sisters. You're old enough to fend for yourself. And at 16, he went on the bum. He lived off of freight cars and hand to mouth. Finally ended up joining the Army, I think, in early 1941. The Great Depression created tremendous hardship on this country and on the men and women that lived during that time. They really knew what it was like to go to bed hungry. They really knew what it was like to go without. We talk about today about the hardships that we, we face. My dad, used to, who came out of the Depression, used to laugh. He says, you guys have no clue of what hardship is. You have no idea of hardship. But my generation does. But I'll tell you this. I think the Great Depression created a generation of hard men and women 
And because of that hardness, that ability to survive, the ability to go without, the ability to suffer through things, we were not defeated in World War II. We were led to victory. And it was because of men like this who, when the pressure was on, acted. The gentleman sitting right here was credited with shooting down a few planes. The doctor went to a dispensary. We all, they all did their duty. They all did what they were supposed to do because that's how, in the military, we've been trained from the Revolutionary War all the way through World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and into the war on terror. It is because of the military men and women that have been trained that defend this country that we're alive today. And we can never let this legacy that these men have given us pass by. We need to start realizing how good we have it in this country and start making this country what it was back then. We need to be a nation that is united See, in World War II, we were a united country. Everybody was in it together. Everyone served in some capacity. And we need to have that again. We're at war, folks. We've got men and women in harm's way, and we are enjoying our Christmas and our Christmas time without even a thought sometimes to those men and women that are defending our very way of life. We can never forget the lesson of Pearl Harbor. When one generation of America refuses to serve, our country will be gone. Those men, these three men sitting here and all of their brothers and sisters, they served this country when it was down and it really needed them. We have men and women today serving, and they need us and they need our support. Thank you. It was almost dawn. Aircraft engines sputtered, then roared. Aviators climbed into cockpits. Six aircraft carriers turned into a stiff wind. In 20 minutes, 183 planes thundered off the decks and into the darkness. It was 6.15 a.m., December 7, 1941. The first wave of the Japanese attack headed south. 50 minutes later, the second wave 167 more planes jumped skyward into the morning light. The attack force was on the brink of achieving the improbable surprise. The idea came from Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. War between Japan and the United States seemed inevitable. But Japan had little chance of winning, unless the U.S. fleet in Hawaii could be destroyed. For a year, Yamamoto and his staff worked on a secret plan. Knock out the fleet, cripple American air power, conquer the Southwest Pacific before the U.S. could recover. A huge task force had to sail undiscovered in radio silence for over 4,000 miles, 12 days. Aircraft carriers would send out two waves of planes to strike in tandem with five midget submarines launched from large submarines stationed south of Oahu. It was a bold gamble. Oahu was the home of the American fleet, the strategic hub of the entire Pacific. The island was rich in targets, but the attack faced the formidable air power of Oahu's six airfields. Yet 350 planes now soared toward the island. So far, no one had come to stop them. It was a quiet Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor, but there were signs. Warnings had come from Washington. War with Japan was imminent. Many expected a Japanese attack, but not here, not on Oahu. 
Early that morning, the American destroyer Ward spotted a partially submerged craft outside the harbor. It was one of the midget submarines. The Ward fired twice, then upon passing, dropped a barrage of four depth charges. A few minutes later, 7.02 a.m., two privates at the Opana radar station saw a bright spike rise on the screen. The sighting was the biggest that they had ever seen. But a lieutenant told them not to worry. Some B-17 bombers were due in from the U.S. mainland. That was probably all it was. Not far away, Commander Mitsuo Fuchida, leading the first wave of 183 planes, knew he was close to Oahu, but clouds blocked his view. Then suddenly, there it was. Blue water, white surf, an island like a green jewel. Minutes later, Fuchida spotted it through his binoculars, over 185 vessels, a row of battleships tethered in pairs. It was 753. Fuchida's radio man transmitted a coded telegraph message. Tora, Tora, Tora. It meant complete surprise achieved. Air bases first. The Japanese plan was meticulous and systematic. Crush American air power before it can get off the ground. Strike the American fighter planes first to gain control of the air. Then hit the long-range patrol planes and bombers so the Japanese task force at sea could not be located and attacked. Dive bombers came screaming down to bomb and then strafe. Then fighter planes, machine guns and cannons blazing. Neat rows of American planes burst into flame. The attack struck air bases at Wheeler Field, then Kaneohe Bay, Pearl Harbor, Hickam Field, Eva, and later Bellows. The placid Sunday was a sudden inferno. At 7.58, a radio operator at Pearl Harbor flashed out the message in plain English. Air raid, Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Too late. The Japanese had command of the air. In 15 devastating minutes, they'd crippled American air power in Hawaii. Just before 8 o'clock, 16 torpedo bombers dipped down and spread out, flying less than 50 feet above the water. The ships below prepared for morning colors. Military bands prepared to play the Star Spangled Banner. A sailor looked up and wondered why the Army was holding a drill on a Sunday. But it was no drill. Torpedoes dropped into the water at close range and churned toward the ships. The U.S. Navy believed the harbor was too shallow for torpedoes, but not for these. The Japanese had made torpedoes that could be launched in 40 feet of water. On ship after ship, a roar below decks, a lurch, a huge water geyser 600 feet into the air, then a choking cloud of vapor, oil, and smoke. Torpedoes ripped holes below. The battleships West Virginia and Oklahoma each took nine in the gut. Two more blasted California. Another struck Nevada. Oklahoma listed sharply. Water rose. Emergency lights went out. Men trapped below cried out in darkness. Above them, more torpedoes slammed home. But half the American battleships seemed safe those on the inside of the moored pairs, and the thick armor plating on their decks would surely protect them from above. But Fuchida's high-level bombers each carried a single bomb, especially modified to pierce that armor. At six minutes past eight, it happened. A bomb crashed through Arizona's deck and penetrated the forward magazine. The magazine exploded. The ship ripped apart. A ball of fire and smoke rose over 500 feet in the air. The harbor was filled with scenes from hell. Men dove from blazing ships and swam to Ford Island, soaked with oil, their bodies burned, shocked. The first wave had succeeded. By 8.30, the planes headed back toward their carriers. Mitsuo Fuchida was satisfied. In 20 minutes, his attackers had crippled the striking power of the Pacific Fleet. He'd lost in return 
nine planes. For nearly a half hour, the skies over Oahu were empty. Was it over? Not yet. Just before nine o'clock, the second wave of Japanese planes filled the air. But again, the fighters and bombers raked airfields and air stations. Bombs exploded on the ships at Pearl Harbor. The objective of the second wave was to finish off any battleships and to destroy any American aircraft that might retaliate against the Japanese fleet at sea. In the first wave, there'd been little time to fight back. But this time, despite their losses, the Americans were ready. Machine guns chattered from the ground. Anti-aircraft fire pocked the sky. A few American pilots got fighter planes into the air. The dogfights began. 20 attacking planes fell from the sky. The battleship Nevada tried to escape by sailing to sea. 23 dive bombers swarmed to attack her. After five direct hits, the badly damaged ship was purposefully run aground to keep the entrance channel to the harbor clear. Fires ignited by a direct hit on the destroyer Shaw detonated the forward magazine, ripping her bow completely off. Finally, the planes wheeled and flew away. It was almost 10 a.m. After two short and very long hours, it was over. 21 American vessels were sunk or seriously damaged. 188 planes destroyed. By nightfall, 1,158 Americans were wounded and 2,390 people were dead. 49 civilians, too, died that day, most from friendly fire. The Japanese lost just 29 planes, five midget submarines, and 64 men. Their improbable surprise had worked with one hitch. No American aircraft carriers had been in port. Pearl Harbor was not a knockout blow. But the bold Japanese attack had changed warfare forever. Naval air power, not battleships, would dominate the conflict to come. The next day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed Congress. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. As he spoke, the Arizona still burned. Desperate rescue workers still struggled to cut through to crew members trapped in the capsized Oklahoma. The last survivor was pulled out that same afternoon. 500 miles away, the Japanese task force was steaming home through a heavy mist. The crews were strangely quiet. The Pacific War had begun. Good afternoon. What you just saw was the official Pacific Memorial Museum film, the visitor's experience film at Pearl Harbor. It was recently produced. Uh, it's a relatively new film. If you've ever been to Pearl Harbor, you know that uh, it is an amazingly solemn sight. And uh, we asked if we could uh, show that film here today. They sent us a copy. And I uh, appreciate uh, the club hosting this event, uh, Dave Cohen and, and Carrie Pastor. And I uh, also want to thank Kevin Hall for his work in bringing uh, uh, this event to fruition. Um, I'm going to uh, invite the uh, veterans to come up and sit for a moment. It may take a couple of minutes to get them up here and settled. Uh, and so as that happens, uh, I'd like to kind of fill you in a little bit on 
uh, on who who they are, and and where they uh, where they were on this this day. And then we're going to be taking some questions. Um, there are pens and pencils at your table, and some cards. If you'd like to uh, to write a question down for one of the veterans, we would ask you to uh, to do that so that we could uh, communicate with them well. Can I help you out there? So the uh, pencils and paper are on your on your table if you would like to um, to ask any questions of the survivors um, today, and uh, we'll we'll try to um, facilitate that as best we can. Association for the annual commemoration of the Day of Infamy. We also want to thank the leadership. We want to thank Ed and the director. We are very honored to be here, and it's really, you should be commended that you have this on your agenda every year. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. He actually uh, took the words right out of my mouth. Okay. Um, I, I've been thinking about this moment for a while because it's very hard to follow uh, a Medal of Honor recipient and the attack on Pearl Harbor and being in the presence of three survivors of that attack. Whoever you are that would want to be in the place I am right now, please come up and take this place. There are no words to, to put in, uh, this moment into perspective. Uh, what you just saw that happened 72 years ago was the beginning of our involvement in a three and a half year conflict that changed the world. And these men, uh, if there is a, a word for them beyond courage and valor, it is the ability to adapt and change. Because their lives changed, our lives changed, and the world changed that day at Pearl Harbor. Um, uh, Dave, do you, can you just uh, use the pointer for just a moment? It's right there. Is it? Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, good. I'm going to give you an idea of where these men were and what they were doing at the moment that the attack came. And uh, then we're going to have an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them and, and talk and ask some questions. It's not going to be a long session. Uh, I did find in my research on November 11th, Joe Triolo did a two-hour oral history. Uh, in a court setting, and was that in Waukegan? In Waukegan. It is, uh, uh, I'm told it's an amazing two-hour session on your service. And sir, I want to say thank you for uh, leaving that record and that every veteran, all of the veterans and all of the service people who are here today need to understand the importance of oral history and how it impacts the future uh, understanding of combat and also of our, of our lives. So thank you for doing that, sir. It's there. We don't have two hours today to go through all of that. And we are also uh, in commemoration mode of the 2,300 uh, lost lives that day. But we are also going to celebrate the victory that happened three and a half years later. And uh, that uh, beginning, which began on this day, 
and that, uh, that challenge that they overcame is really the point of having you here and our point of remembering the importance of Pearl Harbor. So uh, I'm going to just take a minute and, uh, and give you a little overview of where everything is. I can't do it on the screen, so if you're looking at the screen, the dot's not going to show up. Okay, I just want you to know that. But uh, the Perry is stationed over in this area here. The Tangier is here, and the Naval Yard is in this area. Now, um, uh, Lyle Hancock was stationed on the Perry, but he was in this area, actually down here by the entry gate, um, waking up that morning. He was in the shower, I believe, right, Lyle? You were shaving. <laughs> Lyle was shaving. And uh, came to his window and saw what was happening here on Battleship Row and moved up into this area and uh, took a station um, uh, in the uh, infirmary area. He's a, you were in the medical area, the dispensary. Um, let see. Let me just, I can't do all of these notes, but Jack, uh, Jack Terrell, uh, right here uh, on my left, uh, was, um, You were on the Perry, and you were attached to the Perry, but you were in this area. I'm sorry, I'm just, I just completely messed this up. I can't believe I just messed this up. Um, uh, Jack was uh, attached to the Perry, but was in this area and came over to um, serve uh, as in a guard unit on the Pennsylvania. Is that correct? The second wave. The second wave. You were actually in the hull of the Pennsylvania, which is in dry dock, right in this area right here. Uh, okay, so um, I don't know what happened. Okay, there we go. So, so we have Lyle and we have Jack in this area looking up to Battleship Row. Uh, and Joe is on the Tangier. He's in the hull of the Tangier. He's having breakfast. No, okay. Well, we're going to find out what you were having. <laughs> but he did come on board on deck uh, when all of the action started happening. And he could see Japanese planes coming up and down this channel. And he actually manned a 50 millimeter gun and fired back. And the Tangier was credited with downing three planes at Pearl Harbor. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Torillo, Lyle Hancock, and Jack Terrell. So uh, we have a couple questions, gentlemen. I'm going to. Uh, I'm not going to ask you all to answer all of them, but I am going to ask you to make a little statement in advance first, and then I'll ask the questions for you afterwards. Is there something you'd like to, to just say now, sir? Uh, at age 93, I have developed a uh, balance problem. So uh, sitting down is my way to go. And uh, I enlisted in the Navy in uh, March 1940, went aboard the Perry in June uh, 1940, and uh, in December, uh, November of 41, I was temporarily transferred to attend Naval Mine Warfare School in Pearl Harbor. I was quartered in the Navy Receiving Station, which overlooked Battleship Row and Naval Air Station, Fort Island. So, so the devastation being heaped on those facilities. Uh, during the prior to the second wave, I was put in a work detail to go aboard the USS Pennsylvania and two destroyers, which were in dry dock at the time. All three ships were damaged. 
The destroyers were damaged more than the battleship, but they suffered damage. I would, uh, this is my uh, remembrance of Pearl Harbor. I'd, I'd just like to give recognition to some of my family. My wife, Mary, 65 years. sitting next to her, her husband, Jeff Jones, himself a Vietnam veteran. John O'Gordon, currently employed at Great Lakes Naval Training Station. He's a uh, historian, uh, training specialist, and uh, what he doesn't know about the Navy is not worth saying. <laughs> he knows it. God have you, John. I found it on Google. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, this is about all I've got to say. I'd just like to say I'm uh, privileged and honored to be here today. Mahalo. Happy holidays. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to hop over to Joe here for just a moment. Joe Trillo. Yes, uh, I joined the Navy in 1937 in Charleston, West Virginia. I took the oath in Richmond, Virginia at the recruiting station. I underwent training at Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, what I would like to say is this. If we expect peace to continue and we expect to be protected in this country like we all should be, we'd better wise up and make sure that you maintain a strong army, navy, and a military of all branches. And in order to have a strong military and in order to have peace, you have to have a strong economy. And I'm sure you all will agree that all, that goes without saying. We don't have neither today. I was on the Tangier. I was on a 50 caliber machine gun. Water cooled. When I got to my gun station, the ammunition boxes were closed. I couldn't open them. They were closed. So the gunner's mate finally came up. I said, you got to get the keys to these ready boxes. The boxes are closed. So he got the keys to the ready box, and he opened them up, and I got the machine gun going. I was firing on the plane that sunk to Utah. I could see that pilot in the cockpit very plainly, and I observed the role of the Utah. As the ship rolled over, it almost rolled over instantly. As it rolled over, those men that got out of the hull and on the hull of the ship, they, they followed the turn of the ship until they went into the water, then they swam ashore. Now, I also observed a midget submarine off the starboard bow, the USS Monaghan, sunk that sub right in the channel. Now, there were a lot of signs and signals that we should have been aware of. Just think, if we'd had all been at our gun stations, it would have been a different story. Because they only lost seven planes going in, and, and they lost 20-some-odd planes on the second wave. If we'd have just been at our gun stations, that's all we needed. We needed a little time. And at 6.30 that morning, the, the ward also sunk us up at the entrance to the harbor. And the harbor is one mile wide. We should have. And the report was made to the naval station, but no one heeded the report. And there we were at about 8 o'clock, church service, 
and the church pennant was flying from the yard arm, and the Jeps came in, they had a field day. And how about the preparations of Pearl Harbor? The Jeps knew everything about those ships. They knew more about my ship than I did. They knew what time I got up of the morning. They knew what time I was going to go to bed. They knew everything about me because the Japanese were thickly populated in Honolulu at that time. I'm not suggesting they were agents or anything like that. I'm suggesting they had an ample opportunity to know what the ships were doing in and out of Pearl Harbor. And another thing we should remember, they rehearsed this attack in isolated places in Japan over and over and over. And the pilots knew every ship in that harbor. They were really familiar with, with, the, with the fleet. And their objective was to demolish the fleet and have this country sue for peace. Of course, happily, that didn't happen. And another thing I often wondered, why did we have <coughs> nine battleships in a harbor, a land lake harbor, one way in, one way out, one mile at the entrance? Nowhere in naval history will you see ships nested together the charts they show here, they have plenty of room up there, but they had the whole fleet in that harbor. It was a crowded harbor. Couldn't get around. Why were nine battleships in that, in that place? Why were they nested together? No watertight integrity. They were wide open. Three-fourths of the crew was ashore. A third of them were in their bunks. A third in going to church services. There's no opposition at all. But yet, we ignored all the signs that caused the attack. I know there's a lot of second guessing, but that's exactly the way I feel about what happened at Pearl Harbor. A lot of people were asleep. They should have been more alert. Starting that morning at 6.30, when the Antares uh, sunk that sub. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Well, I'm going to give you the mic. I said, okay. Well, <clears throat> I uh, happen to uh, have uh, been detailed in the Navy Yard Dispensary at uh, that time. And uh, we, uh, we had a pretty good duty because we had the weekend off, and uh, we had port and starboard liberty, but uh, that, that didn't work so well, so they just opened up the gates and let us out of, um, out of the yard, <coughs> and uh, it, uh, it, it was wide open. The integrity was uh, completely obliterated because they had, we weren't expecting any uh, problem, and especially down at my level as an, an enlisted man, they didn't, they didn't uh, give us any information about what was expected or what was happening. All that we were interested in was Fort and Starboard Liberty. And <clears throat> so it, it, uh, it, it gave us absolutely no protection because nobody, at least the uh, personnel, most of the personnel, and they knew nothing about Japan. Uh, we weren't uh, acquainted with it, so it was wide open. And uh, we uh, found that all of a sudden, here we are, uh, the bombs are dropping down, and uh, a buddy of mine 
uh, <clears throat> we were both looking out this window, and of course they had each uh, week, and they had the mop drill on um, the air base uh, next door at Hickam Field, so we we were just uh, sitting there, and uh, the attack came and went, and of course uh, what was left was chaos, and uh, so they, uh, I, I figured, well, I, I'm I'm supposed to go on duty that day, so I go in and take a shower. Uh, and I'm in the shower, and they pass the word for all hands to draw small arms. And I thought, my God, if these young kids had no more training than I did going through boot camp uh, there, uh, my, one of my own men would shoot me. And that's when I decided that I better get back up to the dispensary, which was, it was, must have been about a mile or a mile and a quarter, a quarter away. And uh, so I got dressed and, oh yes, uh, while we were standing there uh, and watching this show, um, this one kid said, they're, uh, they're uh, sinking uh, our ships. Well, what do they mean, sinking our ships? Here, here's a big battleship or a battle wagon out uh, there. How are, they going, how are you going to sink that? that? It was happening. So we... Uh, sort of collected our thoughts and I figured, well, I, I better get up to the dispensary because uh, that's supposed to be my battle station and whenever they have a drill or a mock drill or anything, why you're supposed to report to your battle station. And uh, I get down down, down to the main deck, and I started running to get back up to my uh, post there. And they, uh, they just, uh, nothing, nothing unusual dawned on me. And uh, on the meantime, while we're standing there uh, by my bunk, the bunk next door, next to me, uh, the young fellow said they're sinking the um, air, um, air, air, not the Arizona, the Oklahoma. It uh, it's turning over. Well, it, it, here's a battleship, a uh, battle wagon, turning over. How ridiculous can you get? And uh, so I go in to take a shower, and then they pass the word for all hands to draw small arms, and that's when I figured, well, I better get up where I'm supposed to be, because uh, uh, they, there's, uh, there's nothing, nothing for me to do there where I was. So I get down, and I started running, up about a quarter, a mile, or a mile and a quarter, up through the uh, Navy Yard and through the Naval Housing. And uh, as I come up to one of my buddies, he holds out his hand and he said, slow down, he said, because what goes up must come down. Well, you know, it doesn't anything to me. So we get on up to the Marine Barracks, which was adjacent to our uh, dispensary. And uh, they came to this 
drill field there that was between this barracks that I was behind and and uh, a uh, naval uh, dispensary. So we we wait there and watch the show and we see these bombers coming over and they're dropping bombs. Somebody said they're dropping the bombs and of course that was a ridiculous thought. Uh, yeah. <laughs> dropping bombs on on us down there doing nothing. And uh, I, I, to this day, I don't know how I got across that open drill field um, because it just is not in my memory uh, there. And I got over and of course when I got in, walked into the dispensary, it utter chaos. And, bringing them in by the truckloads from uh, uh, personnel that had either uh, jumped off the ship or were blown off the ship and uh, they started to treat them. Well, by that time the attack was over and the uh, thing was quieted down. But uh, that night we were, uh, in the meantime, they painted over all the windows and the uh, doors or any light locks uh, so that no light could get through. And uh, about 8 o'clock, I decided, well, I better go in and get a little rest because later on I might not get rest. I don't know what. I was going to get rest from, but I, I was going to get rest. And uh, so it, uh, it, it, well, I finally fell asleep. And uh, the next day, of course, then we realized that we had been bombed. And uh, the, uh, the personnel were running around, not knowing what to do or where to go, uh, because nothing like this has ever happened to us. So it uh, was uh, chaotic. Yeah. And uh, that, that by that time, things had quieted down. So um, we got through the day, and, and that night, uh, it, uh, I never knew, uh, knew it to get so black at night as it did that one uh, there. Of course, uh, the only place we could go was outside the door. You couldn't, you couldn't go anything of, uh, away from the building because if you did, the Marines would shoot you. But they, they would shoot anything that moved. And uh, so that kept us inside. Uh, and, and, then, and then on we sort of got things as it were, sort of quieted down. And, uh, thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you, sir. thank you very much. I. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I've never heard that uh, end of the story, uh, that part of the story. And uh, I um, have gone through the questions that are here, and almost all of them have been covered, um, except one. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, John if you'd, you'd uh, give us a, your, your impression of this. Uh, we have uh, distinguished leaders from the uh, 5 Deuce here, and two Navy enlisted down from Great Lakes. What would you, would you say to our young JRTC public school students as they prepare to take the next step in their lives? Sir. Well, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. I um, we have uh, military uh, servicemen here and students here. What would you say to them um, as they prepare for their service careers based on your experience? 
you have a uh, real uh, important duty ahead of you. And I know you will do it well. I have utmost confidence in the present active military service personnel. There is nobody can do it better than you guys. So don't let us down and remember Pearl Harbor. Be prepared. You will. Thank you, sir. This is a little off of the uh, uh, ordinary, uh, but uh, Lyle and I were in the same facility on December 7th, 1941. I was on the third deck, Lyle was on the second deck. We saw the whole works, the whole action going on ahead of us before we went our separate ways. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you go to the next slide, Dave? Sure. It was 72 years ago, and there are some words that I, I was thinking about with respect to your service and to the service of everyone uh, at uh, Pearl Harbor in World War II, but also those current uh, servicemen and women that were with us today. I mentioned change and the ability to adapt, but resilience and courage, gentlemen. Uh, you are incredibly courageous veterans, and I think the group that's here today would pledge to you that we will never forget what you did on that day and what happened and how the world changed. And we put up a picture of the memorial over the Arizona I did a little research on it. It was dedicated in 1962, for those of you who don't know, and Alfred Prius was the designer. But Prius noted of this memorial, wherein the structure sags in the center, but stands strong at the ends, expresses initial defeat and ultimate victory. The overall effect is one of serenity. Overtones of sadness have been omitted to prevent the individual to contemplate his own personal responses, his innermost feelings. Gentlemen, we don't know what your innermost feelings could possibly be. We have no possible way to identify with that. But you've helped us today to understand a lot more about this event, and we so much appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Now we have one more thing, if you just sit for just a moment, um, I've got to say, I've got to introduce one more person who is very important to our event today. If you can go to that next slide. Now this is the other side of the war. Judy Brubaker was a WAC, a Women's Army Corps member who enlisted in World War II in the second Air Force after her brother, who was training as a flight pilot, crashed and died. She was about to go overseas to sing with the Army bands, but had a dependency discharge to take care of her mother, who was seriously ill. Although she was a private, she was treated very well. She worked the war bonds effort. There's another picture of her here in her uniform of the day. She went on to Hollywood to make films, and in 1947 was awarded the Victory Medal by none other than Daryl F. Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, and her films were seen in Fox movie tone reels all over the world. The reason that we're bringing Judy 
Brubaker up here is twofold. One is to put uh, another uh, bookend to this event, which is that at the end of this three and a half year war, we were victorious. And also uh, to note that the service of women in World War II was extremely important. And the courage and tenacity that Judy Brubaker displayed during that time is unbelievable. So we've asked her here today to sing God Bless America. Judy Brubaker. Okay, you got me now. I promise. Yeah. Careful, my wife's in the room. Yes, I know. I'm sitting next to her. And yeah. Okay. okay. She's safe. Okay, I'm gonna hold you on this side. Can you? There's one. One. And there's two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Ah, and you're here with these great men. And here's your microphone, madam. Right. Judy Brugger. Would you all stand for? It, Many years ago. The great K. Smith sang this song every Sunday. And I don't have a voice like K. Smith, but I try. Okay, here we go. You notice I'm taking center stage here. Yeah. <laughs> you always do. Oh, thank you, darling. Okay. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her. And guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. From the mountains. To the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Yeah, we're going to keep you all up there for some pictures. And uh, you're going to close the program. We're going to close the program. I just want to say, I hope everyone was as moved today as I was. It was just wonderful to be in this room and to end it with this beautiful song. I think it pulls it all together for all of us. And I think um, our time together, I'm going to adjourn, but I hope that the memory of this lives on with all of you. And just to say again, God bless America. Thank you. <laughs>